I'm Arsha, and I'm with Wardwell. Nice to meet you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sergeant Craig Smith. I am the President of the Board Chair of the Black Health Society in Nova Scotia, and I'm happy to be here to the Black Health Center this evening for an exciting event. I want to start by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, which is governed by treaties of peace and friendship, and we are all treaty people. I also want to acknowledge, uh, I think I saw her there somewhere, uh, Councillor Lori Nipple here. There you are. <laughs> Um, we have administrators, of course, in the front here, who you'll hear from in a little bit. Um, Chief Superintendent, Janice Gray. Where are you at, Janice? In the back there. <laughs> Superintendent, Julie Moss, in the back. You guys didn't have to be in the back. <laughs> and Inspector Rob Bell, all colleagues of mine within the World Canadian Mountain Police and the people that help to run Halifax District within the organization, with the exception of Julie, who takes care of Southwest Nova. I want to welcome you all here this evening. Uh, I want to bring regrets as well from our former Lieutenant Governor, Dr. Mayanne Francis, who wanted to be here tonight, but had already committed to speaking at another event. And also uh, from Sergeant uh, Jacqueline Edwards, who is the President of ABLE, and who is actually in England speaking at a conference right now, so she sends her regrets and wishes she could be here with us as well tonight. Um, tonight's just really an exciting night. It's funny how, it's, to break it right down, it's funny how God puts things in your path, opportunities that uh, when you least expect it. On Labor Day, Rosie and I were in the Quimpool uh, Road parking lot where the Canadian Tiger, she was running the Scotia Bank. We pulled into the spot, she goes to the bank, I look over to my left, or my right, and who's in the next car beside me but Pat Gorm from the uh, Nova Scotia Council and Status of Women. And so Pat and I just start talking back and forth, and um, she goes, oh yeah, by the way, listen, will your book be out in October? Because, you know, the status of women are one of the uh, major sponsors of the book that I'm doing on black women in, the, in, in policing. And uh, she said, well, the book be ready for them because we don't have a, an event that we're going to do yet for Women's History Month, and that would be really great. And so I said, no, unfortunately, Pat, it's not due out until December. And she said, well, we should do something in October to announce that it's going to happen in December. <laughs> I said, okay, I, I can go with that, I can go with that. And so she said, you know, once the holiday is over, uh, my office will get in touch with you. And so Leslie, uh, Corey and McClernan gave me a call, and her and I and Stephanie and Natasha sat down uh, at the status office, and here we are a little over a month later. <laughs> Today was an extremely fun-filled day. You're going to hear a little bit of, uh, about it later on from the end. But what we did was we had of uh, several black female uh, law enforcement officers going to schools around the city. Well, around the province, technically, because uh, we had uh, Leanne went into a school, Ingrid went into a school, Monique, who's uh, deputy sheriff, Monique Drummond, uh, Constable Temple Bracken was in Windsor, Monique and Leanne were both at W. McMillan in Muscadabit, uh, Corporal Christine Hoven was uh, in, in Millbrook, uh, Natasha was at Auburn, and so they went, uh, uh, now Christine Valley, she wasn't actually in school today. She went to school last week for, uh, and went uh, into uh, uh, St. Louis University. And um, we just tried to make sure that they got the word out, that they thought they were who they were, that they shared their, their experiences as black women in law enforcement, and especially acknowledging um, not, only, not only the month, but today, of course, October the 18th, is the 90th anniversary of Persons Day the day by which in Canadian law, women became persons under the law. And so it was really important when Leslie and I talked that we did the same thing. The other person that had to leave early, but also went into school, she went into jail Ilsley, was Shelly Peters. And Shelly Peters is the very first black female RCMP officer. She could only be here for part of the day. So she went to the school, she came here this evening and had supper with the ladies, and they got to talk and, 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 and exchange experiences. Uh, but she had the opportunity to go with J.L. Ilsley, and in all cases, it was supposed to be they were in the classrooms for an hour, 
in most cases, they spent the day in the school. So, um, so you know, I, I thank you all for the time that you gave of yourselves to do that, and I know that the schools are very happy and, and excited to have that opportunity. Tonight's event happened because some like-minded folks came together quickly and saw the value in holding this event and acknowledging black women in law enforcement. So I'd like to thank the Nova Scotia, Nova Scotia Council on the Status of Women, the uh, Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police, and in particular, Executive Director Bill Moore, who was former HRP, who, uh, when I called and said, Bill, we'd really like to bring Ingrid in as our guest speaker. Bill said, okay, Craig, no problem, we'll take care of that. Um, the Greenville Community uh, Center Association in Yarmouth, who are helping to, as well, uh, work on an event that we're going to hold in December when the book is actually released. The Nova Scotia Cooperative Council, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, who gave the ladies the day to be able to go and do this, the women the day to be able to go and do this, and, um, and then, of course, Pat and Stephanie and Leslie, um, for allowing this to happen to our uh, assistant commissioner, our commanding officer, Lee Bergman, who supported this uh, from the moment that I came with the idea to the RCMP and said, we want to do this, and we'd like to be able to have all of our female members of serve in Nova Scotia take part in it, and they said, no problem, go ahead, fill your boots. So I want to thank them for giving me the opportunity, um, for us the opportunity to be able to do this as well. Um, I have spent enough time up here talking, and so I am now going to turn it over to your hosts for this evening. Uh, Riel Williams, who uh, works here with us at the Black Council Center, and Constable Natasha Dentees, who works out of the Cold Harbor Attachment here at the I'd also like to thank our board and our staff here at the uh, Black Council Center for pulling this all together and for doing all the other little things like the beautiful programs that you have in front of you and some other things you'll see a little later on this evening. everyone and welcome. My name is Natasha Dentist and I am a constable with the RCMP in Cohart. Good evening, my name is Riel Williams and I'm the manager of programs here at the Black Cultural Center. October is Women's History Month, a time to celebrate the achievements of Canadians and Nova Scotians who identify as women and to look ahead at the work that must continue in order to achieve gender equality within our diverse communities. This month is an opportunity to talk about how we continue to advance gender equality, support safety, and foster economic growth that benefits the whole province. This year's theme for Women's History Month is Make an Impact. It honors women pioneers of our past, like First Nations activist and teacher, Anna May Aquash, Canada's first female police officer, Rose Fortune, and women's rights activist, Marielle Duckworth. Nova Scotia women, girls, and gender diverse Nova Scotians are key drivers of Nova Scotia's future. And we all have a role to play in ensure, ensuring Nova Scotia is an inclusive and safe place to live for people of all gender identities. October 18th is the 90th anniversary of Persons Day, marking the Persons case in 1929, which declared women as persons under the law and established women, women's right to fully participate in politics and affairs of the state. The historic decision to include women in the legal definition of persons gave women the right to be appointed to the Senate of Canada and paved the way for women's increased participation in politics and in public service leadership. Today in Nova Scotia, about 60% of senior leadership positions in the provincial public service are held by women, and there are 17 women MLAs, the highest number of female MLAs ever elected to the legislature. At this time, we're going to have remarks. Uh, first, we will hear from Minister Tony Ince, who is with us tonight. He is the Minister of African Nova Scotian Affairs for the province. Followed by Minister Ince, we'll hear from Constable Tamu Bracken of the Windsor RCMP. And following Constable Bracken, we will hear from Deputy Chief Sheriff Leanne Sample, who's here on the platform. Uh, Deputy Chief Stample is a retired uh, RCMP officer. She was the first black female uh, to join the RCMP from this province, and she retired as an inspector. Currently, um, as mentioned, she's Deputy Chief, uh, Deputy Chief Sheriff, and she, was also, she is also, pardon me, the first African Nova Scotian to hold the position of Deputy Chief Sheriff. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. So first we'll hear from Minister Hicks. Thank you, ladies. Um, Natasha, Graham, and I too will begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kma'i, the ancestral and traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people. It's inspiring to hear about people's lives, especially when they work hard to realize their dreams. Persons Day and Women's History Month is a time to reflect on the achievements of women in society and everything they've done to bring us closer to gender equality. Learning about how women overcame barriers to be the spark that helps someone move from dreaming to achieving. Folks, you know me, I can't stick with the script. <laughs> <laughs> dreaming to achieving. You do more than that. You nurture. You gave us life. You give us wisdom, all while you're doing your jobs at protecting and making sure the rest of us are okay. So thank you for that, first of all. <laughs> now I'll get back to the remarks. <laughs> the book being unveiled tonight is about women who made an impact across the country. And I can't wait to read it, to tell you the truth. Craig, congratulations on your fifth book. Craig, keep writing. Keep writing, Craig, because you're unearthing and you're bringing stories that many of us aren't aware of within our communities. So thank you. It's important for people to know about black women leaders in law enforcement, such as Rose Fortune of Annapolis Royal, and Canada's first black female RCMP member, Shelley Peters Carey, who we heard, well, we heard from earlier today. <laughs> this will be Sergeant Craig Smith's fifth book, as I've said. And I'd like to congratulate him and the sponsors, partners, and all of those who helped put this together. The Black Cultural Center, the volunteers, the publisher as well. Sergeant Smith and the Black Cultural Society understand how important it is for community, especially for young women of African descent, to know the paths of women that came before them. I can't help, sorry folks. <laughs> I can't help but uh, say thank you. I think I've said enough. My true heart goes out to you guys because not only in the jobs that you do and the danger that you may face and the uncertainty in your jobs, there's a lot of people throughout society who couldn't do it. So thank you. Hello, my name is Tim Bracken, and uh, I, I work out in uh, Windsor, in Windsor Town. And I've been a police officer out here now for 23 years. And I understand I'm the longest serving uh, black female police officer in Nova Scotia. <laughs> uh, it's funny, when I first came to this province, uh, there were three of us, Leanne was one, and uh, 
and then there was Kim. It was for, for quite a while, it was just the three of us in the province. And uh, coming from Toronto, um, it was an eye opener for me. Uh, <laughs> uh, Christine reminded me a uh, conversation that I uh, had with her is I wanted to come to, uh, to Nova Scotia because I wanted to make sure that there was a black hairstylist uh, for me. <laughs> and, uh, it was hard to find when I first got here. And uh, I was looking for Jamaican food, and I never did find it when I first got here. But, uh, um, I didn't. I didn't know that uh, coming to Nova Scotia, there, were, uh, there was an Indigenous Black community, and uh, and I'm so glad um, that I was able to to come to a province where there was so much proud Black history, and uh, I've learned so much. Uh, I was lucky enough to start working in Cole Harbor in my first post. I remember. Uh, <laughs> um, actually, when you were volunteering before you were doing that. Yes. Yeah, so um, my, my journey to becoming a police officer was actually difficult. Um, I actually had to have uh, a lot of mentors that had to help me along the way. Uh, when I started writing the test uh, back in Toronto, uh, I wasn't successful, but a lot of it had to do with the fact that I was lacking the self-confidence in the test, and I was having a lot of panic attacks. And uh, there was an association called the Association of Black Law Enforcement Officers, um, uh, my cousin was on it, um, another relative was on it, and, but one of the members actually took me aside, helped me physically, helped me emotionally, helped me write the test, and really mentored me and, uh, and got me to where I needed to be. And, uh, and as a police officer, I make sure that I give back, and when there's anyone that needs help, I make sure that, that I'm there for them because I know it was so important to me. And, uh, and, and I've, I've been very lucky in my journey um, with this organization. I've been able to give back and to help a lot of people. And uh, I only have uh, probably a few more years left. And, um, uh, but I can tell you this, this job has been wonderful. And I've uh, been able to meet a lot of wonderful people. And, uh, and I'd like to thank uh, some of you in the crowd that I've known uh, over the years. Thank you for helping me with my journey. And, uh, and, uh, and Craig, thank you so much for, uh, for having me up here today. Good evening, everyone. Well, this is quite a surprise. Thank you, Craig. I, um, Craig walked in and asked me to speak, you know, like an hour ago, so that's <laughs> And then about 15 minutes ago, Craig said, you mind sitting right up front? <laughs> no, I'll do it. <laughs> so thank you, Craig. Not the first time he has done this to me, so I shouldn't be surprised. Because I think he did it to me last time. Um, so he has asked me to speak about our experience today. Um, I, I guess I shouldn't be surprised that he got me to speak at the last minute because I asked Monique to come with me to do the school presentations today. Um, we were in Duncan McMillan and we we're talking on the way up and she says, so like we got a presentation, we got, I'm like, yeah, no, we're winging it. <laughs> when we get there, we're going to wing it. <laughs> um, and you know what, it was a great experience. We were supposed to be there for an hour. Uh, we were there, we got there around 11.30, we left at 2.30 when the power went out. And so we're going to get on their buses anyway and go home. So it was a great time. But there was something about that experience. Um, Duncan McMillan is a school that is P to 12. And the experience in that school today, for myself and Money, we go into the older grades and we're kind of explaining, this is women, Women's History Month, and what that means, and it's 90th anniversary of uh, Persons Day, and what that means, right? To be a woman in that time. And they're kind of like, yeah. <laughs> right? But it's like, what do sheriffs do? <laughs> <laughs> like that's that's the reality. What what is that and what does it mean? But when you explain to them that sheriff services have 235 employees. Um, from the chief or the director down through um, to our deputy sheriffs. So there's 235. There are maybe 20, we were counting, counting. 
There's maybe 20 females, right? Five African Nova Scotians, if we're lucky, um, and 10 uh, Aboriginal employees. So that's not great right now, right? Like that's, that's what brings us out into the schools and out to talk. So if you're talking to the older grades, you can explain that to them. And then we made the bold move <laughs> and we went into the younger grades, right? And all they want to know is, do we have peppers? <laughs> do we have lights in our cars? <laughs> Do we have guns? <laughs> Which we don't. <laughs> right? Those are the things they want to know. And so we're walking through that with them. The best experience I would have to say is at the end of the day, we went into the grade one class. Just little, little people. And they were, one, well, excited we were there. We were all police officers. They, really didn't understand. We walked them through sheriff services a little bit and, you know, the court system and all of that stuff. And it was great. They had great questions and they wanted to know what we did. But at the end of that session, when they were all giving their little notebooks to go home, one little African Nova Scotian boy comes up to me and he says, are you a police officer? And I said, well, I used to be a police officer. I'm a sheriff now. He goes, you look just like me. <laughs> and that, in that moment, was the best of my day. traffic and the accident that happened on Main Street. So thankful that everyone's here and they're safe. So I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Deputy Chief Ingrid Berkeley Brown, who's with us on the platform. She was born in Guyana, South America. She is the youngest of 11 children born to her dad, Cardwell Palouz, who was also a police officer in Guyana, and her mother, Walter 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 Green Palou, pardon me who was a housewife. Ingrid immigrated to Canada in 1974, where she completed high school at Sir Sanford Fleming in Toronto. Following high school, she married, pursued a post-secondary education uh, at Seneca College, and eventually gave birth to a son in 1983. Ingrid completed her post-secondary education in 1985. Then, in 1986, she began her policing career with Peel Regional Police. As a constable, Ingrid performed duties in Uniform Patrol, Community Services, the Race and Ethnic Relations Bureau, and then on to Child Abuse and Sexual Assault Bureau. In 2002, she was promoted to Sergeant. Her succession of promotions continued as she became a Staff Sergeant in 2007, an inspector in 2013, a superintendent in 2016, and finally becoming deputy chief in April of 2018. Wow. Currently, Deputy Chief Berkeley Brown is in charge of Field Operations Command and oversees the airport division at Pearson International Airport in Toronto the Communications Bureau Division, Duty Inspectors, and the Crime Analytics Unit. Deputy Chief Berkeley Brown has a varied background of education, including, but not limited to, a Master's of Arts in Leadership from the University of Guelph, School of Business and in Economics. She was later honored by the same university as a top 10 times 10 alumni with impact. Deputy Chief Berkeley Brown is also the recipient of several awards, once again including, but not limited to, the Governor General Exemplary Service 20-Year Medal and 30-Year First Bar. 
While remaining active on a number of boards and committees, Deputy Chief Berkeley Brown is also a member of the International Association of Chiefs of Police, the Human and Civil Rights uh, Committee, did I get that correct? And also is the co-chair of the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee. Did I also get that one right? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. And I didn't mention, but she is also presently in Canada right now, the highest ranked female, black female police officer in our country. Wow. Join me now in extending a very warm welcome to Deputy Chief Ingrid Berkeley Brown of Peel Regional Police. Okay, so uh, everyone's already been up here, and I'm going to continue the tradition and say good evening. I hope everyone is uh, having an enjoyable day. And it is an honor for me to be here today. You know, I want to start by saying um, that today I had the opportunity to meet some wonderful, wonderful children at the North Preston, North Preston? Nelson Winder. Oh, Nelson Winder um, Elementary in North Preston, yes. right? You know, and the one thing I can say about my experiences with the young children today is that um, there's a bright future for the people, young people, in Halifax. The students were very, very open. The questions that they presented were questions that I had never received as an officer in Ontario. I mean, they were really at that high level. So I was very impressed. But I know, and I'm sorry, don't remember names. <laughs> Leanne? Leanne mentioned that um, one of the questions uh, came from her student that's always made her, brought her to tears today. But I'm gonna say, the one thing I really enjoyed also today was that they all told me that I don't look any a day over 30 years old. <laughs> so I promised them that I will be back. They told me the compliments. So I want to start by extending my sincerest thanks to Greg for inviting me here today to speak to such an esteemed audience. I mean, and how much more important can it be than today being person's day, right? So that really did have some impact and I really enjoyed seeing the people in the audience today. Um, I, I thought I'd you know, talk about myself. It's clear that um, when I look at some of the women who came before me, as, as you said, paved the way, you know, um, Rose Fortune, um, Muriel Duckworth, and of course the famous five. Who, who marked a turning point for equal rights for women in Canada. But I realized that it's these women, because of their tenacity, their, their strong work ethic, and their perseverance, that they've inspired me by their passion and their conviction and their perseverance in the face of that adversity. That simply to achieve their vision, they were prepared to stand, uh, stand their ground and stand up for what they believe in. In my time here with you today, I just wanted to offer you some snapshots from my own journey to becoming a police officer. As, as mentioned, I was, the first, I was the first black female officer with the Peel Regional Police, and that was in 1986, and of course the highest ranking officer. And so I want to talk about my journey becoming an officer, and some of my experiences as a police officer and a woman of color. For me, I've used the philosophy of perseverance when working to achieve my vision. I have been determined not to let obstacles block my path and prevent me from achieving my goals. Today, I can say I'm living my dream, having overcome obstacles that were trying and, and I want to make it clear that it's not so much about becoming a, the rank of deputy chief, but more so about becoming a police officer. When I joined Peel Regional Police, I'll try to keep up. and learned my way around, 
I was determined that I would not leave Peel Regional Police in the rank of a constable. So that's the entry level point. Because somewhere inside of me I felt that it was in a supervisory role that I could truly make a difference. And I'm not saying that as a constable, you can't. There are things you can do, but I believe that it was in the supervisory level that I could have more impact in contributing and bringing about change within policing and certainly within Peel Regional Police. I believe that I'm here today as a deputy chief because when I came to Canada from Guyana at the age of 14, I had my foundation which contributed to my drive and my determination. And I'll tell you why, as a child in Guyana, I was always one of the top three students in my class. So those, those um, experiences, they truly influenced me and developed the confidence that drove me not to be discouraged by negativity directed at me as a woman of color growing up in, a, in an environment that was predominantly Caucasian. For the most part, when I came to Canada in 1974, more so Toronto, there were no persons of color that were represented or reflected in key positions. So there really was no known role model or mentor for me to work with or aspire to. I know, um, and again, I'm really, there's lots of people I've met, so names, you know, it was mentioned that um, I was the last of 11. But when I think of the sacrifices my mother made, she moved to Canada with nine children from Guyana because my dad passed away when I was six as the youngest. So for her, I truly honor her for her tenacity and her work ethic to start a new life for us in Canada. And Canada has been very good to myself and all of my siblings. But it was my mom who taught me about overcoming obstacles at an early age. When I graduated from secondary school, Sir Sanford Fleming, financially, my mom could not afford to pay for me to attend a post-secondary uh, institution. And as most West Indian parents, OSAP, or what we call in Ontario, which is a student loan, was not an option. She was not going to take out a loan. Okay. But I was determined to get a post-secondary education. So what did I do? I worked full-time and did my studies in the evening, ultimately obtaining my honors diploma in social sciences. Somewhere along that road, I took some time out to get married and have my son. <laughs> so I, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate for that. But my goal in studying social science was simply because I wanted to help people. And it's through working towards my goal that I first became aware of a potential future in becoming a police officer. It was a chance encounter with a male black officer in Toronto while doing my co-op placement. And his name is, uh, he's now passed away, his name was Sid Young who actually with the Metropolitan Toronto Police, who actually approached me and said, have you ever thought of becoming a police officer? And though my dad was a police officer, my dad passed away when I was six, so I really don't know, perhaps inherently it was inside of me, I don't know, but just hearing those words from this um, young officer really kind of set me on that track. So what did I do? He put that idea in my head, never look back. So following our conversation, I went, to the Metropolitan Toronto Police um, headquarters and uh, to apply for a job. And I think this is when I encountered my first setback. I think today we may, it may be termed um, systemic discrimination. So this was in 1981. So I'll let you guys figure out how old I am. I'm pretty old. Okay? <laughs> I, I attended Metro uh, Employment Office. And the first thing I was directed to was to step on a scale. So that was the entry point. I stepped on that scale, and I was told that I would be disqualified from the process because I was underweight. So there was a height weight requirement within policing. And I know that Shelly's is not here, but I know apparently she also entered the RCMP in 1981, and she encountered something similar, and that was on her height. So it, it, it's not specifically unique to um, black individuals, but it certainly was limiting for certain individuals because not everyone's tall. Again, 
to meet certain height and certain weight. So having it come to that setback, I was undeterred. Really? I was tempted to return with weights in my pocket. <laughs> Just that. I threw that idea by my brother and kind of told him, nah, not good. So I joined the gym, worked out, tried to gain some muscle, started my family, as I said, because my studies. And um, while, while I was still also working in the private sector, four years later, I began the application process again. This time, so that would have been in 1985, I passed the weight test, moved on in the process, and was successful in the written and fitness test. I was fortunate to get an interview and waited, excited for word on acceptance, but I got that dreaded rejected, rejection letter. Well, what did I do? I was determined to find a reason behind my rejection because I felt that this would provide me with ammunition to become a better candidate in the future process. I was told that I was not confident enough, and I was, but again, I wasn't going to let that stop me because really failure was not an option. And, and when I, as I was preparing for this, what, you know, I thought back, right, of the different agencies that I went to, and Toronto Police was kind of the agency in Toronto. And I just think of some of the conversations I had with the recruiter, and I mean, this was the time before the human rights. Uh, so it was pretty, uh, it was pretty dark. I, I recall um, my first husband I was married to, when filling out the application, and, and anyone who's a police officer recognized that it is a very lengthy application form. So it required things like um, the address of my uh, mother-in-law, etc. My mother-in-law lived in Trinidad in a rural area, so I didn't have that. And I explained, I tried to explain to the recruiter. And says, well, you know, I don't have that because I, it's difficult getting, you know, having mailboxes, etc. And I mean, the terms that, I, that she used, it was clearly, she says, I don't care who's screwing who, you need to put that in. So those are things that were kind of left with me, right? You, you can't forget those words. But what I did, being unsuccessful, I did my research, and what I did is I learned about volunteering and the benefits that came with giving back. I saw it as an opportunity to develop my leadership and my communication skills while interacting with people from diverse communities. And at the same time, as I said, giving back to the community. I went to the Jane Finch Mall, and I've learned that uh, Tam Moot speak about, um, what did they say, six degrees of separation, also grew up in Jane Finch, <laughs> which is an area I grew up in, uh, and did volunteering at the information booth. And my role in this information booth was to assist individuals, mostly newcomers to Canada, who were seeking access to resources. And it's through this position that I learned the value of volunteering. There were many individuals who dropped by and I took the opportunity to get to know them on a personal level. How they were doing, were they able to achieve whatever it was that they had set out to accomplish. And there was something inspiring in seeing and hearing of their successes and listening to their challenges. I continued volunteering and in the fall of 1986, I again began the application process applying to police services. But through my volunteer role, I learned about other police departments. It's not only about metropolitan Toronto. Yeah. And again, this time, I decided to apply to Peel Regional Police, the RCMP, the OPP, because I was determined not to put all my eggs in one basket. I was going to be reaching out. So I submitted my applications again, um, and I was successful following the test to receive my first call to become an officer from the Peel Regional Police. While in training with Peel Regional Police, I received phone calls from the RCMP and Toronto, but it was too late, I was already on my way. And I mean, hey, you called me first, you're getting this, right? <laughs> in that second process, one of the things I recall, and this was from the um, OPP, which is the Ontario Provincial Police, the recruiter at the time, his words to me was, um, it's unusual to have a married woman applying for a position as a police officer. Usually, it's the husband's. Again, you know, obviously I didn't get that job. But those, those are just things that you heard, and I mean, 
you just moved on, right? Who are you going to complain to? Mm -hmm. So being selected as a member of the Peter Regional Police was, known, was by no means the end to my challenges. In a cohort of 32 with Peel Regional Police, I was the only black female, I was the only recruit with a child, my son was three years old, and I was also one of the oldest. I was only 26, but I was old. <laughs> <laughs> because most of the recruits were 21, so. <laughs> uh, moving on to the Ontario Police College, and this is where all of the recruits in, um, in Ontario go for their training, I think for the RCMP, the Decor in Regina. So we, we all go there. In a class of 300 at the Ontario Police College, I was one of two black females, and that, um, I got to know uh, the, the other black female, her name is Sonia Thomas, um, and we're now lifelong friends. Whether the police college did this deliberately, whether it was deliberate or by design, Sonia and I were in the same, I mean, I call it um, residence, we call it pods, but we were, we were together with about four other females. She became my confidant, I was truly my lifeline. My experiences at the police college taught me the value of professional networks. Because success at the Ontario Police College meant developing friendships and building trust with individuals who were very different from me in many ways. I went from being surrounded by family and friends who were black, of Caribbean, Canadian or African descent, to being immersed in a predominantly white environment. So this meant for me, I needed to step out of my comfort zone, which was difficult. But you know what? I used that opportunity to teach others about my culture, and I took the time to learn about theirs. Yeah. And I know um, Tammy spoke about the hair thing. <laughs> As most black women will know, the one thing I did not know when I joined Peel Regional Police and when you went to the police college is that you had to do swimming. So I don't know if you to do <laughs> college, they, you would put in a test to see whether you were a rock or whether you could swim. Well, I was a rock. And that meant you went in the water and you just kind of literally sank to the bottom, right? But it's through my peers at the college that I truly learned how to, how to swim. And I also took the opportunity to do, um, learn swimming at the Y between the break because I knew I was going to pass. But it is my peers at that college that really supported me through that. Because I know we all know what that here thing we get around. <laughs> what are you gonna do? <laughs> you know, most of my um, most of the adverse interactions I had at the police college were mainly through the um, through the instructors. Uh, Sonia and I felt isolated, selected to um, do things that were inappropriate, and I mean, I, I'm not talking sexual, but just, just some of the um, interactions. Uh, and I know, like, for instance, if we were on the firing range, you know, uh, the, the target back then, I think now they've changed it pretty much, it's just kind of almost a brown color, but it was black and the back was white, and they'd be making inappropriate comments there. Uh, Sonia also had some uh, challenges with, uh, with driver training, with, with driver driving, yeah. and uh, when we finished OPC, she was unsuccessful in driver training. The passing grade was 75 and she was given 74. And driving training was pretty subjective. And I mean, one point really. So she had to do some remedial. Right? So those, those are just some of the challenges that we encountered. For, for, the, for the most part, through my formative years with Peel Regional Police, the challenges I experienced were, di were different uh, internally. There were no mentors that existed for me. I struggled. And not wanting to um, reach out for, for advice from my colleagues for fear of being labeled as incompetent. So my current husband, I met him on the job, and he's from St. Lucia, he's, he's black. So for me, that became my sounding board. I also reached outside of the organization to individuals I'd come to know through work I've done in, in the community. And it's these individuals, mostly women from the black community, who encouraged and supported me. I saw their determination, commitment, and the work that they were doing in the community. 
And I know that they were working very hard to forge relationships between the community and the police because it was pretty fractured. In 1989, two of our officers shot and killed a young black uh, male. Uh, he was driving a stolen car, and the car was driving away, they shot and killed. So there was, there was a lot of tension within the community. So I took it upon myself. The one thing I did, and this is something I chose to do, I chose to move into the, um, my first transfer was into community services and in race relations because I really wanted to stay connected to the community. I honestly can say that I was concerned that if I did not do that and I went into maybe the, um, the, the drug unit because that's where most of the black male officers were going. But I don't know that I saw that as building bridges. I saw some of that as really, really breaking it down. And I felt that I wanted to do the work of building those bridges. So for me, race relations and community services is what directed me. Uh, so now I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> and the positions that I mentioned, race relations and community services, these were not coveted positions within policing. In fact, they were looked on as soft positions, right? Today, policing is going the other way. Community policing is the wave of the future because somewhere policing has come to recognize that police officers cannot do it alone. It is with the support, with the trust of the community that is how we get results. So there are those breakdowns, but it is community. So we kind of look the other way now. Working in the community is a key position for any officer. So certainly from my interaction with these um, the individuals within the community, they inspired me to mentor others and they contributed to my success as a police officer. Anytime I'm in any kind of situation that requires support, those are the people that I reach out to. They're still standing there for me and they will always come to my support. I, I, was, I was telling Craig today, I think one of the reasons I really never experienced anything blatant within the organization. I think it was strictly because my peers knew that I was heavily invested in race relations. And so I think that kind of put that, we just discussing that, that kind of let them know that it's not something I would tolerate and I would have to, you know, address it at whatever level I can. So I can say that I decided to stay the course in spite of these challenges. And with the exception of my promotion to superintendent in 2016 and deputy chief in 2018, I had to apply a minimum of three times for every other position or every other promotion that I received. Do I believe that I was overlooked for promotional opportunities because I'm black female and not a member of the in-group? Of course I was. I know that. Especially the in-group in policing really does. But I, I made that effort, as I said, I, was, I could not, um, I'm gonna say sell myself to, just for a promotional opportunity. I always say, I have to look at myself in the mirror every day and I know who's looking back at me. I know that when my policing career is over, I will still be a black female. So for me, that was always number one. So intent on succeeding, I work hard, further my studies, and competed, of course, for the opportunity. Now as the first black woman in Canada to achieve the rank of deputy chief, I hope that our youth, and it doesn't have to be just black youth, but just youth, can take away a sense of optimism, certainly from my story, and those of trailblazers, especially women, who are, especially women who are looking for careers in non-traditional environment. Like many of you here today, I chose to face challenges with persistence, knowing that many others have done so before me and with the sense that I may be an inspiration for those coming after us. So in wrapping up, I just want to leave you with three simple words that I use, keep in my back pocket, and I keep close to my heart. And those words are, yes, you can. Whenever I'm in situations that may prove challenges, 
and I begin to have self-doubt, I always say, yes, I can. Thank you. young women um, to continue on to be professional women in this world. So I would like to bring up um, our uh, artist tonight. Um, her name is Martha Mutelli. I don't have her bio, unfortunately, but she will be doing two wonderful spoken word pieces for us. Um, so can we please welcome her to the stage? We are today, tomorrow, and the day after. 
We are nurturers and lovers, poets and storytellers. We are exactly who we are meant to be. Black and magical, black and powerful, black and beautiful. We are here and we ain't going anywhere. Hey. I'm willing to teach if you are willing to learn, but I will not learn if you will criticize or judge. I will not learn if you refuse to acknowledge that I am capable of learning. Do not choose my future for me. It is not your decision, but my own. But if I want to learn, help me, and you will become a better teacher. Teach me to study and help me read more. Teach me that learning will open up doors. Teach me my history, the greats of the years, of those who fell down, got back up, and persevered. Teach me skills to lay proper foundations so I can show others, the next generation, the future leaders of our nation. Show me you care and not just right now. Show me that my problems can be worked out somehow. The past worked so hard to get us this far. They did not give up or let down their guard. They were taught to speak, they were taught to lead. Now it is your turn to push us and encourage us to succeed. Respond to my silent cries, please do not turn your back. Stand with me, beside me, help me know truth from fact. Teach me respect and teach me to care. Help me achieve greatness and help me to share. Help me move forward and help me to pray. Remind me to know that I will get through each day. Don't leave my side and catch me if I fall. And promise even on my bad days you will let me give my all. Success does not come easy. In this world, nobody gives. But because of you, I have a reason to live. Teach me and shape me. Help me to do my best. Guide me. Please do not lie to me. Help me pass every test. Tell me the truth. Tell me what's right. Be there for us youth with all of your might. Help me build structure, order, and grace. Help me to run this educational race. They say we are the future and they tell us to strive. But no matter what, through thick or thin, I know we will make it and stand tall with pride. Walk with me, talk with me, let's go back to the start. Thank you for being in my life and taking heart. So I got to start the evening and I get to end it. Um, I'm going to ask Ingrid and Leanne to just move the chairs back so I'm going to pull the table back. I also want to mention, as I was going through um, those attendance today, that tonight I missed our one of our other past presidents, Dr. Leslie Oliver, who's here with us this evening, and as well the chair of the Halifax Women's Commission Board, and the board is also here with us. So about two and a half years ago, Pat Gorham, Stephanie, and Leslie and I got together and sat down to discuss the book, her story, Black Women Leading the Way in Canadian Police, the Canadian Law Enforcement. It was initially due up in around May or June of 2017. And as many of you know at that time, um, our family was waging a battle uh, along with my youngest brother who we lost in June of last year, uh, two years ago now. And so the book got shelved and well, well, I believe that everything happens for a reason, and that is not revealed in my time, but in his time, over that two years, some things came a little bit more into focus. They're not completely there yet, don't get me wrong. But the hiatus enabled me to search myself and to look at my writing, and, and, and it allowed me to find more individuals. So over that two year span, I found more black female police officers across the, uh, the country. Um, I was able to include an honorable mention section in the book that includes not only Ingrid, but includes uh, other inspectors, uh, Isabel Granger from the Ottawa Police Department, uh, Sonia Thomas from the Toronto Metro, uh, Vanessa Leslie from OPP, um, and then to look even deeper and find the late Gloria Bartley, who in 1960 became the first black municipal police 
officer in Canada from Toronto. She passed away a year ago. And I was able to talk to her son in Toronto and get her bio and get some information on her. Um, uh, it was through one of our own black female members, um, Lisa Levesque, who told me about her aunt, Carol Mintus Norrington from Cambridge, Nova Scotia, who in 1974 became the first black female municipal police officer in Atlantic Canada when St. John New Brunswick hired her on their force in 74. We had never heard of her, never talked about her, never knew about her. So I got to add her, I got to talk to her and speak to her, and unfortunately her husband is waging a, a battle with cancer right now, and so she wasn't able to be here with us because we had planned to bring her in as well. Because we have to make sure that we talk about those things, and we recognize them and appreciate those folks. Then within the last little while, I got in contact with some folks in Manitoba, and um, spoke to a lady by the name of Monica Maherney uh, Chertok. She now lives in Florida, but she's the first black female police officer from Winnipeg Police Department. And so she sent me her bio and her information. So that two years has given me the opportunity to grab a whole lot more, to learn a whole lot more, to talk to a whole lot more people, and to add those. And so as I said, the lens isn't completely focused on, you know, why things happened back two years ago as they did. But I do know, if I put it in the proper perspective, it's allowed this book just to grow and grow. And it's allowed me to, to, to look and, and think about the stories of, of other women as well. So that in putting together the book, it's not only just carrying a gun and serving and protecting that needed to be included, especially when I talked about the RCMP experience. And so I started reaching out to our public servants. And so I'm able to feature a number of different black public servants who work, who are at the front counters in detachments when people are coming through the doors, who are uh, answering the telephones when people are calling in in distress and looking for help. Um, I was able to reach out and look at some of the black individuals, the black females that have served on advisory committees for our, our commanding officer and our commissioner that have helped to guide and direct and shape some of the ideas, some of the policies, and some of the things we do, and to ask some of the tough questions that sometimes us in uniform can't ask to get answers for. And they're just as vitally important as us that are in uniform. And so I've included a, a, a number of them as well, in particular from this province, because of the fact that we've led the way in a lot of ways when it comes to that. And so I ask right now that those ladies that are in uniform, and the other individual that's here that is also in the book, if you'd all come to the stage right this moment, you know what you mean. Get up here. Get up here. He likes that over on this side. You gotta go that way. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Keep going, keep going. Okay, my first <laughs> So here's the cover of the book that will come out in December. Um, I also want to acknowledge the fact that through the efforts of um, the Nova Scotia Advisory Council on the Status of Women, who were the first first uh, people to come to the table and say, yes, we support this and we want to do what we can to help make it happen. And then the Canadian Chiefs of Police, the Greenville Community Center Association, who applied for Heritage Canada and received funding, the Nova Scotia Cooperative Council, and the RCMP. Uh, the third week, mid-December, the book will be launched. We will be, in, we will be doing something similar to today, but we'll be doing it in six different black communities across the province from one end to the other, uh, where the book will be unveiled and we'll have community events held in um, in community centers across the province that acknowledge these ladies, their efforts, and the way that they help to serve and protect us each and every day. So I thank you all for coming out, and hope you enjoyed the evening. I know we ran, uh, you know, started a little late because the traffic wasn't helping us, um, but then we're, you know, starting a little late to allow for our, um, our spoken word artist for Martin to get here and perform. Uh, I hope you were inspired and touched by Ingrid's story. I'm so happy and glad that she was able to, and so willing to come when I said, Ingrid, would you please come and take part in this? And it was a yes without a hesitation. That we're able again to bring some history back to Nova Scotia, make some history in Nova Scotia, and pass it on to everybody else. So thank you for coming up. Thank you once again, everyone, for coming. Before leaving, um, we'd like for you to enjoy refreshments and have an opportunity to shake hands and meet people. And uh, um, yes, and.